but on the community's behalf. We have used you on the community's behalf, although the community may disagree with us. But in terms of argumentation, we say that, yeah, we act on the community's behalf, right? So this is by Richard again. Are you still with me, or does it make sense? Go. And again, this notion of stigma versus the normal applies to any form of aggression, irrespective of whether a form of aggression is an abstract one like this, or over covered aggression which we studied. So yeah, if, we, if I had to, well, this is for the tagging. <clears throat> if I had to classify, I, I don't like typologies myself, but I'm more like a theoretician guy, and I know that you guys love these things. So if I had to typologize forms of aggression, I would, well, identify three types, again, two being relevant and one being irrelevant for our project. The first one is the recurrent non-doing the ambiguous kind of aggression, and you don't see to see when you, when you seem not to do anything, but you are doing it. So action is basically not uh, non-action, right? So it seems that everything is harmless. You just bully the guy, like in this case, in the case of, of the health service. You just, for example, not invite the person, but the person feels that you are aggressive and he is being abused. The second one is the covered one, the one which we have studied, and Finally, the overt one. The overt one is just worth noting that here I call it reference to the stigma. Because in order to capture overt features, basically, what we find that this let's recall a little bit what we discussed about Mexican yesterday in the course of our conversation. If you want to identify lexical items in, together with which features when it comes to cover or overt aggression, I think our work might be made easier if we try to identify lexical items which are stigmatic. Say we study a rape case or kind of sexual harassment. The words will be body, boobs, legs. So all kind of things which are physical, which belong to a female person, right? But what are these words are? These are the words of stigma. Because in this case, the, person, the female person is the stigmatized one, the one who is being attacked. And this is why her stigmatic properties will be pointed out, or will be voiced in the, in the aggressive behavior. Does this make sense? And this is why, okay, it's not entirely right. Okay, let me repeat this. So what is the basic problem? How can we tax things? We need to identify, oh, sorry, how can we identify tokens, lexical items, which are relevant? Basically, the idea was that we, in each scenario which we studied, we try to identify 300 words which enact aggression, which was the idea. The problem is, how can we sort of decide what kind of words we study? That's a basic problem. But to some extent, when it comes to, say, a political debate, we, we can combine words like no with high pitch. No, 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 this is what we talked about yesterday. But in most of the cases, what we have to do is to look into the victim's stigmatic properties. Again, in the case of aggression, there is a victim. We agree about this. There is a victim. But there is not necessarily a victim, but a target. How you target this person, you stigmatize this person. I'm talking about criminal activities here, maybe. But in the case of aggression, plain aggression, there doesn't have to be a victim. I mean, in the case of a political debate, there is not a victim, of course. That's plain aggression. But when it comes to criminal aggression, there must be a victim. If there is a victim, then there is stigma. The victim is weaker than others. This is why he or she becomes a victim. Because he or she is a victim, he or she has stigmatic properties which makes him or her different from those who are powerful in the situation. Say in the case of a sexual harassment, but is the stigmatic properties are, what makes the person vulnerable is that she is a female. Right? This is why these people start to sexually harass her. So in this uh, in other case, in other uh, words, basically there are stigmatic properties associated with the victim, and these 
stigmatic properties in the case of sexual harassment might be the victim's feminine properties. So, when we try to identify lexical items, we need to look into lexical items which reenact these properties, like in the case of a female, it might be physical properties, beauty, and so on. Does this make sense now? Cool. So, stigma is there. Uh, and in the case of covered offense, like, for example, but I told this to you, like, like, um, like, do you have fire? Or, hey, hey, you are beautiful. Man, you don't really just go in and be very aggressive on the spot. In the covered offense, there are references to the stigma as well. But when it comes to overt offense, it, it can only be basically a reference to the stigma. So, I kill you, bastard, and then <laughs> I make references to, to the person's stigmatic properties. Does it make sense? Or not? So I, in, in the rest of this talk, and I try to wrap it up in 15 minutes, I'll just go through these three types. So what do I mean by recurrent, non-doing, and then covered and overt offense, although the latter categories you already know. So recurrent non-doing, basically if you don't do anything, seemingly, and you make the person feel that you are not doing this in order to be aggressive, then it's a form of aggression. So even though you don't seem to commit aggression, you can be aggressive. This is a type of aggression which you can't capture by using any software. So we need to admit defeat. We can't study any form of aggression, which is great. Because if we admit our limitations, we make an important self-reflexive step towards objectivity. So it's quite important to admit our limitations. It is an example of, of recurrent non-doing. Isolated. Staff involved would never sit with me during morning tea, lunches, meetings, courses, etc. My name was omitted from Thursday acknowledgements. All other staff names on whiteboard in staff room and on the trays were in black. Only mine was in dress. When we were asked to bring a plate for morning teas or special lunches, no one ate any of mine. I volunteered to help on many projects, only to find later that the projects had been completed without my help. It's aggressive. People commit aggression against this person. But will this person ever be able to prove this? No, it's unsafe. We can identify these situations as linguists, as theoreticians but this is not something which we can help. Not even lawyers can help this. There were cases when people, what I said, when people turn to solicitors, try to sue the committers of the wrongdoers who committed such acts of aggression. And in most of the cases, the solicitor says, that sorry, I can't help, because this is not something which you can prove. This is not something which we can prove, but we need to be aware of it. Uh oh Yeah, well, uh, but, but yeah, I had a longer conversation here, but I don't think that we have enough time to go into all examples. Basically, um, here was an online conversation when somebody was left out from, I mean, continuously left out from the conversation, so it was again an unseen case of aggression. The problem with the unseen case is that if you try to defend yourself, saying that why you are being aggressive, or if you an ex as an external observer try to intervene, as an, you try to say that, hey, here is a form of aggression, then the normal, those who commit the act of aggression, would say that, no, we were only joking. You are not being uh, reasonable. You are acting unreasonably. You are not being abused. And this is why it's difficult. Because these kinds of aggression can be reconstructed sort of by the wrongdoers. It can, they can be explained on the discursive level. This is why it's very difficult to prove them. Or even it's very difficult for the victim to defend him or herself. But if he tries to say that you are abusing me, then the others will say, no, you are an idiot. We didn't uh, abuse you. You are just making up a story. It's, it's, very, it's a bad form of aggression. Um, well, covert offense. Um, we have studied the case of covert offense. Um, 
that here I have an example of a typical puppet of hands like I can't emphasize enough the value we place on some research keys, I mean Dave, Phil, Nigel, whatever the heck your name is. But it's just a cartoon, so not important, but it represents what's going on in these covered cases, which we studied on the first day already. So sometimes you don't seem to uh, commit an aggression, but the aggression is there. You don't scream, you don't talk in a high pitch of voice. It is roughly the same with the, do you have fire mate? And then you will hit him on the face. It seems to be very gentle. There's nothing wrong with that one. It's just not the proper way of, for example, here. I mean, you, you, could, you could talk about the other's name. You could say, that, sorry, I forgot your name. And it would be okay. It would be okay in many places. But the problem is that there are certain places and times in which it is not okay. Do you, can you remember this? I was talking about this on the first day. So, for example, if I go to a guy at a cash machine at midnight saying, do you have fire? The problem is not the question itself, but the time and the place. This question shouldn't be asked there and then. Here as well, if you are somebody's manager like here, you should know his name. So it's not the proper place to make this question. This is why it makes it ritual. You play the role of the bully, right? This is covered offense. This is easier to study though, so I still believe that this is something which we can study, luckily. The good news is that, I don't know what happened to my slides, by the way, but it doesn't matter. Um, well, we talked about, the, about this on the first day, so covered offense is something that we can study because there are lexical items, typical lexical items, which the bully use. And actually, for covered offense, we might be interested in an alternative pitch. So this is what we started to discuss. So it might be that if you want to capture certain forms of, of abusers, we may not want to look into high and low pitch, but rather, I don't know if, if computer experts can identify a kind of abusive pitch when your tone of voice go lower or deeper. Because I can imagine, we can we should play with this later on. Yeah. Yeah, no, what I mean is that when people, I can imagine that, I, I've never done pitch research, and this is why I'm just speculating here, but I can imagine that empirical research may show that although there is not really high and low pitch in the case of other offense, like doing a fire mate, you, you know, it always goes like this because you, you know that you are a bully and something going to happen, and you are going to talk like this. It's different from your ordinary pitch, right? A tone of voice. It's a question whether we can study this. If we can, it's great. Uh, education, uh, I have to repeat this question. Um, if uh, we handle threats, so, uh, threats for types matter. Suppose in, in ritual cases like folk songs and others, there are also lexical items involved. And uh, that kind of same lexical items are using uh, in the aggressive normal species. So how can handle uh, threshold map types? Do you understand the concept? <coughs> <laughs> because in computational perspective, I am asking. <laughs> oh, that's, I mean, that's like, you should change with change. But in this, but is both uh, times, uh, which are, uh, I think, if you will, uh, equal. Uh, when which undergoes a change, then that will be good. <laughs> I mean, is it just pitch? <coughs> what kind of other features we can be And then there are uh, like formats and which are the most common. I know, but is it not alternative kind of? voice recognition which we could play with. More complex. Yeah, maybe not at this stage. We should just be aware of this fact that, that there might be other features that we want to study later on. We would need to admit this, that um, in the long term, we may want to study other features, just this. Yes, one of the ways I think working uh, in 
basically that we go ahead say we have few features which we think are relevant and we experiment with that and see how well the system performs and then we carry out an error analysis on where the system has gone wrong we try to find patterns with the error yeah. the patterns of error and then we try to figure out the ways yeah. uh, that we could uh, <coughs> use uh, and we will use of more uh, more sophisticated features would help or we need something else to work with the error Yes, it tends to become really uh, mechanical. I mean, theoretically, we could cause a lot of features, but we experiment the ones which are easiest to get, and then we look at the errors and see if we need more sophisticated features. Yeah, um, well, this is good news, isn't it? I mean, in a sense, if we can, well, we, we start with, with just one feature, the pitch, and we study political debate in which aggression is quite straightforward. And as we need to go into re refine the system by taking on covered cases, maybe at these situations we would like to look into alternative positive features, is what I'm saying, depending on the availability of the detective, or how can we detect these features. But we could, of course, uh, uh, in as a background study, we could have all these uh, features in our inventory. Yeah, it's a good idea. Then we implement some, okay, in implement it incrementally, so yes. uh, first a few, then more. Then. Yeah, this sounds good. Like, I really know that, I mean, what I observe, but this is just my empirical observation, because I've studied an awful lot of cases, when it comes to cover the questions, it's really this kind of rudeness of your voice. It's exciting, it's kind of exciting to be a bully. <laughs> Some are lower, but I just don't know how, because I'm not a prosodist or prosodic also the expert myself, so it, it, it should be done by someone like you who, who knows what we want to do. Maybe someone like Kalika. Yeah, Kalika. Yeah, yeah, okay, so but let's keep very this in mind, okay? Yeah, of course, that, I mean, well, that's, that's also important. Yeah, so this is why I'm talking about these various categories. Well, when it comes to overt offense, it's just cool. I mean, it's easy to start like a political debate. Overt offense is just there, you make the aggression there and then, like in the case of a bully, when you say you're right, metal mass, metal mass is not the uh, And then the, the poor guy says, yeah, just um, doing some homework. So you're going to do my homework as well then? Um, I, I said, are you going to do mine for me then? You know I would, I've just got some things that goes on. It's a typical case of aggression, right? Again, here is, for example, a stigmatic. Because I was talking about these stigmatic expressions like metal mouse. It refers to the person's stigmatic properties, kind of nerdish to have this character on your teeth. Like a cool guy, a bully wouldn't have this. So the bully would properly refer to your spectacles or whatever that makes you vulnerable from his perspective. So this is why when we categorize scenario, when we talk about scenarios, that means to categorize our scroll list accordingly, we need to build up our lexical inventory in the recognition system, at least partly on the basis of, of these hot words, these stigmatic words, okay, which they would count, which would count as stigmatic words in a given context. Does this make sense? Uh, okay, I think I skipped this. Um, oh yeah, but there's one thing. Morality. I need to revisit morality. When it comes to recognition, they are working on. Do you think that the person who commits an act of aggression thinks that it's a nice thing to do? Of course not. Being aggression is not nice in any car. Being aggressive is not nice in any car. Chair. Even in political debates, losing your temper is a kind of bad thing, right? So you lose face, it's no good. So the thing is that um, usually in, so in different societies, aggression is condemned. I have studied, I have written an awful lot about this, I don't go into detail. But if you look into ancient conversations, like in medieval Europe, I'm sure the same is in India, then you will see that people condemn the aggression ritual aggression in particular, 
uh, back in time. Some ritual forms of aggression, like embeddings, for example, might be allowed, but when it's more harmful, people say, no, 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 you shouldn't do this. And even if something is ritual, people will talk about it, whether it's nice or not, like yesterday, at the dinner table, when they came to these wedding rituals, it all be that they can easily go wrong, right? And this is interesting because we ourselves talked about whether a ritual, whether these forms of practice can, can be accepted or not. So they are problematic to some extent. So from a cognitive perspective, um, the thing is that there is no, when you are being being aggressive, there's an awful lot of moral pressure on you. And this is why your pitch changes, for example, when you commit a covert aggression, you're told it like this. Hey mate, do you fire? Why? It's exciting to do this. But also you are aware that Ooh, I'm not uh, doing something not so nice. You know this. I'm normal and I should I should commit this wrong deed. But on the other hand, you are aware that you shouldn't. Because there's this broader social understanding beyond your understanding as a bully. And you are aware of this broader normative understanding, which protects the victim by default and which triggers intervention. So when you commit a wrong deed, you often are aware of the fact that others may help the victim. The police may come, or there might be a machine which detects you, right? There might be a uh, camera or a software. So what? If you, know, if you do this, there's a pressure on you, morality. You may wrap up your behavior as moral. I talked about this on the first day, but irrespective of what you are doing, there is the sense of morality that what I'm doing is immoral because being aggressive is not nice. It's not like impoliteness. Uh, being impolite can be nice. It has nothing to do with morality by default. Aggression does. There is moral aggression, but moral aggression can only come into existence when there is a sense of immorality as well. So you can be morally aggressive, say you intervene aggressively to protect someone, if a previous act of immoral aggression has taken place, right? So say somebody slaps his girlfriend on the street, then you intervene, say, stop, stop, stop. You are being aggressive, but only because the other has been aggressive. But if you just commit an act of aggression yourself, then there is this moral pressure thing. And this is, it is important for us to be aware of it again, because this moral, moral or this is, it, it, it is at least partly this moral pressure which, in my view, causes changes in your normal pitch of voice. It must be there as a factor. And I know it sounds extremely theoretical from your perspective, but it has to be reformed with. Because sometimes, even when it comes to lexical items, like, for example, I, I raped this woman because she dressed indecently. If I say indecently, this bully, this, this crim criminal, we refer to a moral principle. He will say that I have the moral right to do this act of pain because this woman did not dress properly. That's the argument. Of course, he knows that this is a very bad argument. So he's aware of the broader moral pressure. This is why he himself tries to moralize. But you see, this whole behavior, even the choice of lexeme, is influenced by the sense of morality. This is why it's very much there. So this is basically, in this first lecture, I just overview types of aggression. I talked about their inventories. I talked about the notion of stigma. It's important, very important. I talked about the notion of morality. It's important. They are not important from the system's perspective, but as we set up the system, these are factors which, which we somehow need to reform with again. I don't know how we need to talk about it. Well, this is it really, so I'll stop now. It's been 45 minutes. Any questions? If you don't worry, if no, because there are other topics to, to be discussed today, so just in case if you have any questions, feel free. But don't feel pressurized, don't pressure. Basically what I think we need to do is to run through these things, what I have to say, and then sit down and talk seriously about our project and how to 
to incorporate as many factors as possible into our research. The good news, I mean, I mean, what I was talking about here are concepts. You can't incorporate concepts per se into a model. But we are all talking about the choice of lexical items, for example, and, and pitch. So it comes to the choice of lexical items. The existence of stigma is great because it makes it easier for us to pick up the relevant words. And also moral things. So for example, when it comes to a rape case, it might be that the rapers will, the, or the, the rape committers will refer to the, to the indecent closing of the world. But they define as indecent, of course, it's a legal definition. But for example, closing might be there in this lexical inventory of this, this act of repression. So in a sense, this lexical, or some of the lexic items can and should be approached through the lenses of morality. Yes. Okay, doc. If there is no question, then... Okay. Okay, I think I probably don't uh, really understand uh, the scope of morality probably in uh, the way you put it. But say for uh, for uh, rape cases or for uh, uh, even for something like gendered talk, no, no, not not going up to that. Day, but just this case of gender talk, there is, uh, and is it really, uh, is, is it really something to do with morality? Probably, it's, um, um, I don't know. It's, it's almost like um, it's model for them to, and the other person is committing um, an act which is which is not acceptable, which is not right, which you may call immoral. But the person who is uh, who is uh, committing rape is truly it's not uh, immoral for him to... But he knows that he is immoral. But he wraps his immorality often a moral cloak. I'm going to talk about this in the next lecture, but let me get into this morality thing again. So there are different... Okay. Um, go back to my previous slide. For example, there are, okay, first of all, there are moral orders. I was talking about moral order yesterday. Can you remember that? So there is a flow of events. Bullying, committing an act of regression, is not how the event should flow. So it violates the moral order of sex. However, the wrongdoer, the aggressive person, may pretend that this is how sh should it flow, how should the event flow, but then, uh, in the end of the day, he or she is aware that this is not. So seemingly, you can argue for being moral, but then your argument will be in the broadest frame of being immoral, because you know that in, in, in terms of social judgment, your act is being immoral. Now there are two senses of morality, and we'll, we'll, I will discuss this in my next lecture. There are two senses of morality which we need to go with. One is the moral order, so the organization, the structure of the event. Right? This is the moral order of things. Preference structure, as, as we studied, that's moral order. And then there is morality in a popular sense, in a philosophical sense which it cannot be separated from the moral order of things. Because often, for example, when you violate the moral order of things, people also talk about morality in a philosophical, popular sense. <coughs> Say, for example, a rape case. You go to an unknown woman in a bar, on a bus, say that you have a beautiful body. What is here? Morality is violated in two senses. This utterance is not being said in the right place and time. In other words, it's not something which is preferred to be done. 
and also it triggers an unpreferred response of silence, right? So the moral order of things, the flow of things is being upset here. But also there is a sense of morality here that the rape committer would think that, hey, this is an indecent woman, I should rape her. But then I, I'm aware of the fact that, but people will know that it's very, it's a very evil thing to rape someone. So I, as, a, as a criminal, we refer to morality also aware of the fact that my act is morally condemned. So this act, for example, going to an unknown woman to commit an act of aggression on a bus at midnight is immoral in two senses. First, in a technical sense, it upsets the moral order of things. And then, B, it is highly immoral in the popular understanding of the word of morality. Does this make sense? So uh, when we talk about moral order, we are probably talking about uh, uh, more uh, and say an accepted order in, in particular. Well, moral order is something which counts as the normal flow of events. The normal flow of events. But you going on a bus, going to an unknown person in a threatening way is not the normal flow. Of Right. So it's not yes. how things okay. should be. So yes, I mean, it's not it's strictly in terms of uh, right and wrong. But it is wrong. I mean, uh, if somebody comes to you, an unknown person, suddenly when you are alone and he's much stronger, is it? Can it be right? You would be afraid, even if he is not a wrongdoer. You would be afraid. I mean, think about this. I would be afraid. Arnold Schwarzenegger comes to you, saying, hey, how are you at midnight? Because we were quite fine, right? So there are places and times which, which trigger, so, you know, some occasions, even communicating with someone is not something which can be moral, which can be normal. That's the problem. It can only be abnormal, and this is what causes the problem. And as we want to detect aggression, criminal aggression, we are interested in these unusual places and times. This is why we put our machine, if we will have a machine, into hot spots of crime, where, which, which trigger these unusual meetings, interpersonal meetings. And as soon as a meeting is unusual and unexpected, it's already immoral in a technical sense, because it upsets the moral order of things. The, whether the conversation becomes moral or immoral in a popular sense depends on the content of the conversation. As soon as a criminal exit incident takes place, it's going to be immoral, of course, in a popular sense, and moralize, moralizing might be there. May or may not be there, that's a different question. Yeah. Yes, so basically we are equating I mean, <laughs> normal with Yes, yeah, so when it comes to our machine, our program, what we do, A, we focus on, I mean, when we do our scrolling menu. Yes, so. No, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, No, well done, I mean, it's great that we have great story, because this is what I wanted actually for today. So, look, we have this scrolling menu, right? In certain cases, like in a political debate, we cannot play with the moral order of things. Because in, 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 in a political debate, it, one is expected to be, or one can be aggressive, it's still not criminal to be aggressive. But in other cases, in criminal cases, criminal cases, in criminal cases, aggression usually takes place in, in, in areas or places where it shouldn't, right? So we, can, we, we cope with the moral order of things as we create our scrolling menu. So we study places in which conversations should not take place, at least between strangers. This is what we want to study. This is the first sense of morality which we can incorporate into our program. Simply when it comes to a scrolling menu, we set up certain venues of context by considering whether there are scenarios in which a conversation shouldn't take place. Like again, a cash machine 
The cash machine, there cannot be conversation between two strangers. If there is a conversation, then there is a threat. Already. You, you can't converse with someone in front of you at a cash machine because it's so private, right? The guy puts in his PIN number and you say, hi, but he's putting in his PIN number. <laughs> yes, um, I mean, it's, it's really, it's really not that strict to uh, Yeah, okay. <laughs> I will say, uh, in a typical, on a typical hot summer day, is air conditioning inside the uh, okay. gas station. So, so maybe maybe they should talk. Uh, yes, no, no, people just, uh, they are not supposed to, I mean, they are not supposed to be more than one person at a time inside the... Okay, no, no, I'm, I'm with you, I'm with you. No, then let me, okay, maybe I was talking rubbish in a sense. So let me then revisit this. So first, this, this technical sense of morality, should and could be studied simply by looking at the at the preferred or this preferred response, okay? So let's forget about what I was just saying about time and place, because it might be a misleading one. No, time, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, it can be still, yeah? Yes, that's just still relevant, because say, uh, I will say on a perfectly normal, pleasant evening that would not make much of a sense. Uh, if somebody enters into the room and says that, you know, it was very hot out and so I got Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so let's keep this in mind. But I think what, what Liz was teaching to you is the most important thing. So prefer this preferred response. If there's a this preferred response from, from, the from the victim, it means that, for example, silence. Somebody comes to the lady, says, oh, you have a beautiful body, and the poor victim is in silence. This is Preferred and the aggression is there. So the moral order of things is being upset, that's the basic thing. So morality in the technical sense is being upset, but it actually this preference involved. But then there is the second popular sense of morality, which is going to be there often in terms of aggression. Say, like, ooh, look at your clothing, like this one, or your sexy kind of thing. That's moral moralizing on the metapragmatic level. You animate the fact that you are just a cheap woman and I'm, I'm entitled to rape you. Of course, this is highly immoral. But then this guy will refer to something moral in order to balance the fact that he's committing something extremely immoral and he knows that he's immoral, right? So this is why this popular sense of morality should also be part of our inventory when we build up our lexical observations of aggression and threat. Yeah. Does this make sense? Yes. Cool. Um, okay, let me stop here for a five minutes break. If you, um, but let's keep it for oh, questions, questions, great. Would you say it is an aggressive society? 
No, no, no. I mean, no, I mean, uh, but Shakespeare is a good, good point. I mean, yes, I'm saying that what I'm saying is that people will more, I mean, the wrongdoers tend to moralize. The society will, by default, I'm going to talk about intervention in the next hour. So by default, people want to help, help the victim. I mean, everybody, and most of the people feel with the victim. This is why we are here today. We want to develop a software to help the victim. I mean, societies are good by default. Societies feel with the victim. <laughs> I mean, there are some cruel societies, like in, I, I found in Saudi Arabia, where, for example, a, a public rape is allowed. Or hey, say, hey, I remember a case in India <clears throat> where there was a village in which they wanted to punish the woman whose brother married improperly by gang raping her. So the village elders said that, yeah, we should publicly rape the woman. But then there was a huge uproar in other parts of India. The police came in, people were arrested. So what happened? The majority of people said that this is no, 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 it's evil. So societies are good. There are normative social values that rape is no good. But when you are a wrongdoer, you, make, you, 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 you pretend, you, you try to fake that what you, do, you are doing is good because you are aware that it's, very, it's really no good. You see, there is a moral contrast here. And this highly influences your behavior, even your pitch, although I have no evidence for this at all. You should study pictures because I think your, your pitch changes when you know that you are not being moral. It's like, ah, it's no good, no good to rape someone. Uh, since you are going to talk about intervention, I expect my next question to be good, but uh, for example, uh, within this country, like, some groups are in minority, like provincial minority. Yeah. So, whether they are in Delhi, Italy, or like somewhere else, like they always face, uh, what do they, like physical abuse, not just racial abuse. Yeah. But then, like, nobody seems to care, right? For you, in nobody case, seems to yeah, care. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Can you can you can you expand this? Sorry, but could you just but so so minority people what have you? you yes, well people are even killed in broad daylight and nobody cares. Like you have cameras showing people killing another person and like people just walking right past. Nobody cares. So what do you say? It's aggression. Uh, well, it's like it's aggression. You say? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean uh, it's a, it's an important question and this is beyond what we can address here, because there are social problems in which people fail to help. It's, I mean, I, I just, I've studied this with Chinese colleagues. In China, there was a huge, 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 huge problem. In the south, south city of Guangzhou, uh, somebody really hurt a child on the street, and nobody wanted to help. People just passed by and said that it's not their matter. Mm. People said that we are an evil society. So yeah, this evil society thing is there. Also, there's the famous Kitty Genovese effect in New York. As many the social psychological term, the Kitty Genovese effect. Basically, in the 1960s, a, a, a woman called Kitty Genovese was killed, a rape that killed on the street. And there were 110 people around. Nobody helped because all of them were expecting someone else to help. So, this is a problem with intervention. Sometimes people don't help. But then, when it comes to social discourses, though, people will agree that this is not nice. Like, for example, abusing minority people. Yes, people may not help, but on the other hand, when it comes to media, say, or the normative voice of society, will people still say that it's good to abuse social minority? No? May I something more? Like, for example, in the YouTube videos, like, we see, like, uh, they do social experiments, right? Like, people arguing, like, pro like people abusing each other, like, Children getting lost, and then like you ask those uh, those around who did not intervene, why you didn't intervene? And they say like uh, there are legal issues, like you are not supposed to do this, the law does not allow you to do this. Like it's mostly like European or like Western or not Asian. So I was I was wondering like how is it different from like actually abusing and not intervening? Like what's the difference? Um, it's a very good question, and I'm going to talk about this in the next hour. Ah, okay. Partly because it's something ongoing. So I'm just with Chinese colleagues. I'm, mm -hmm. uh, I have a professorship in one of the Chinese universities. So I often go there. And I have a Chinese team of researchers with whom we study intercultural, cross-cultural differences between Asian and European behavior in terms of intervention. So far, it's quite interesting. I mean, what I found is that 
Asian people often say that our societies are cruel and people don't have, don't have. But what, I, what, what, what empirical data shows is that they do interview, but in different ways. Say, but what I, what empirical, so far what empirical evidence shows is that Asian, I mean European people often intervene one by one. So if I see somebody being bullied, I go there and say, you stop it now, myself. A, in Asia, it's more like a collective kind of intervention. So there will be people circle, circling this, the wrongdoer, try to help, but there needs to be a critical mass to do this. But these are some superficial differences, and in the end of the day, I don't think that there is such a thing as a cruel society. In every, I mean, intervention needs a lot of factors to operate. Sometimes Western people don't intervene. So uh, there are no clear-cut culture differences, and there is no more or less cruel society, I would say. It's, um, the fact that you are talking about it showcases that Indian society can't be cruel, because otherwise you wouldn't be talking about it. So I, I, I mean, sorry, just, just an additional note. In Saudi Arabia, it's absolutely normal to rape a woman if she disobeys. They wouldn't talk about this. You are talking about this. So what does it mean? You are sensitive. So how can you be cruel then? Yeah, but, uh, okay, so you, like, you're, like, the computer, like, here, we're trying to develop a software and uh, we're just trying to, like, help. Yeah. So, like, if we will, I, I, I think you'll cover it next to us. Hmm? Say it again, sorry. I, I assume that you're going to cover this, so... Yeah, I, I will, but if you have any questions, go ahead with it, because <laughs> we can sort of... I mean, do, do you want a coffee break, or can I just jump on, on the train? But I think it's quite interesting, this discussion, so I would like to carry it forward. But if you would like to have a coffee, it's fine by then. But why don't you just help yourself while I'm talking? Yes, so we may have... Yeah, so if anybody wants to go to the toilet, feel free. Meanwhile, I keep on talking because it's quite interesting, so go on. I mean, I feel free to go out and sort of have a technical break, okay? So it's informal now. <laughs> I was wondering, like, what use will this uh, software be? Anyone think it's like them up? So, like, okay, you identify, you, like, okay, those, let's say, the police, they make use of the software, and maybe it's developed. So they make use of the software and then they try to identify these as this behavior as aggressive, non aggressive, or like uh intimidating, whatever. But what if like like uh, I'm sure you'll talk about this, but like what if like no like no one ever like, no one actually helps, for example. Uh, what if nobody helps? Yeah. It's bad, 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 but 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 hold on, but we try to do with Swedish Atul and the is basically to create a software which triggers intervention by the police if it's a criminal case because that's the best intervention and if somebody who is entitled to intervene, intervene. So what we try to do with this software is to trigger intervention. What I'm going to talk about next is intervention in general, so more in a popular sense. Because, well, the best scenario of intervention is policy intervention because the police has the institutional uh, little, uh, you guys are smiling, but no, I know, but hold on, if you intervene, I, I know you will say that thing that the police is not nice, blah, 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 but, 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 who has really right to intervene? Do you have right to intervene? You may have, may end up in a trouble, say, a guy beats up his girlfriend on the street, a minor little person is being abused, you jump there and hit the guy on the face, he goes down, you are in a trouble, aren't you? Yeah, that's yeah, you are in a big trouble, potentially, at least in the UK. I'm not sure if I would try to physically intervene because I would get jailed, maybe, you know? So it's not a good thing. And this is why police is there. It's the police's duty to intervene. So whatever we say, <laughs> the best intervening part is the police. And this is what we try to work on in the long term, to be, to alarm the police. But there are alternative forms of intervention. I'm going to talk about this. And there is no intervention as well. What we are interested in, with the police here, is to, to trigger the police intervention. That's what, what we are interested in. It because it, often, it is often the case that there is no intervention. And this machine simply will force the police to, to, to intervene. Right? And that's the good thing. Uh, if I may. 
Yeah. See, sometimes I, for me, okay, like, I don't know about you or any other little talk about my dog. Like, how I felt. When I was in Guji, people were getting killed, people were getting abused on the streets. And it's like, sometimes in the camera shot, you can you see police, and even policemen are, like, standing next to these abusers. And then, like, they don't do anything. And then, sometimes, uh, if you have been arrested, you will notice this. But if you haven't been arrested, then you have it. But, okay, I, I, I may not go to Konot's place. Then. <laughs> <laughs> you may be afraid of, of telling that, but hold on. But um, if there's a machine which clearly makes evidence, because that's a good thing in auto detection, this is why these guys know something mm. extremely good. So, this is what computational guys know. In computers, evidence remains. So, if there was an act of a question and nobody did anything, then you just I mean, the victim just needs to find a good lawyer and sue the hell out of the authorities for not helping. We don't aim for an ideal, huh. and that's any. We don't aim for an ideal situation where you see hundred cases of aggression and you see police <laughs> coming up and acting right away on those hundred cases of aggression. That's not the way we perceive it. Perceive it, and that's not the way we should perceive. We should. We should expect that. That's I any. Mean, I no, but, but hold on, Ritesh is a revolutionary like myself, so with my friend Ritesh we would say that yes, we put pressure on the police. Yes, yeah. that's the point. I mean, say uh, we, we are ignoring 100 cases of aggression right now, even if we, uh, we could trigger intervention in say 40 cases, uh, I would say that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Right, so yes. I don't <laughs> I don't need to target your software or no, accuse no, 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 but it's a good, but point. No. <laughs> good point. Good but point. But what I want I to say is, like, uh, you say that this is super essential to say that uh, the society is bad or like, but I didn't address it. But like, since you say that uh, it is the role of the police to intervene, and uh, they are not intervening, so for me, it is difficult to say that the society is not aggressive. Like, for example, it's like sometimes it's useless to expect help, you know. Sometimes you know that even if there's a case pending with proper evidence, nothing can really happen. So even if you have evidence, when nothing is happening, that it, it, can we call it that uh, is aggressive? Like not just the one. Not, I don't mean to say the society in general, but uh, no. I see your point. I mean the problem is. I mean yeah. I I want to be too. It's very difficult to say things about society. So you know. I mean, we all feel bad about society not helping, and it's not just here. It's everywhere. But, well, what to say, I mean, we can only hope that we make society better by, for example, designing such a program. So, I see your concept, Riemann, and I understand what you are saying, but, uh, I, I, but on the other hand, people talk about these issues. I see huge mass protests in India, in the news, against rape, for example. So, I don't think that society is as such as it's cruel or not. It, it's very difficult, uh, very, it would be, really overjoyed to say that a society is cruel because then people would protest against their own <laughs> people, for example. So, um, what we need to do, and what we can do as linguists, is to raise public awareness, right? Yeah. Maybe I haven't talked too much, but let's say, suppose something happens to you, okay? <laughs> like in India, like if it happens to him, then only his side, maybe his university may help, maybe his friends, maybe his community will come, but the rest, they'll go, they they wouldn't they wouldn't care. So from the Indian point of view, I would, I cannot really like, move away from the point that uh, this society that doesn't care like whatever happens to other like which yeah. sadly. And as an Asian, like since you are European or since you are non Asian, I should say that uh, if you go online, as soon as you are you are like Asian, like let's say there was this top festival in China. Yeah. People like you get all sorts of negative like uh, comments on the media, like all sorts of news were uh, saying this, this is. I'm expecting that they're they were being aggressive, and and then if you talk about pets, they say we eat our pets, but what about those who like kill their pets when like they don't do anything? For us, we eat them. It's so like for us, it's so like, like you treat them, and then like what I what I think is like sometimes the the puppies are not good enough. No one, nobody wants to buy them, and then like they are killed. And then you try to moralize it, you try to justify it. Oh, it was better that they were killed. Yeah. They say. And, but when people eat dogs, you say that uh, dogs are pets. 
hearing these things and this that and that so like for me like you say stigma. You know yeah. about stigma. So like can we can we say that like uh, there was accuracy for like news, whatever news or whatever. I mean you are talking about already the criminal case developing, but yeah, of course everyone who is being I mean animals have stigma, but you can't mm -hmm. then use animal verbal animals verbally really because they can't communicate with you. So yeah, yeah. Let, let's not forget this, we are talking about language here. Yeah? No, no, no. What I mean to say was, uh, I, I was just describing the incident, but uh, I was I, I was asked if there was like something like aggressive news, for example. Yeah. Is there something called aggressive news? Yeah, aggressive news. Well, but <laughs> we are not interested in all kinds of things. I mean, news might be aggression. In, in, I mean, news, by, news might be aggressive. But we, we are now talking about aggression on which is taking place here and now, while news are mediated, of course. So it's, you know, you, you get news about aggression, but that's a different thing. We are not interested in this uh, kind of thing. Yeah? No. So, uh, yeah, just, just let me. No, no, but I think I, I understand well, but basically what you're saying is that in Asian and European societies may work different. Yeah, no well, doubt that that things work differently. The question is not... Uh, yeah. yeah. But the response of the people, like, I thought they were very aggressive. The people. The people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I think, well, I mean, but what we are doing here now really is to cope with all kinds of aggressions and we can just look into individual cases, linguists. So it's better not to talk about society and the people in general. Because what we can do as linguists is to look into individual cases and full stop. Maybe I'm more but... Uh, no, but I, I would suggest let's move on because I will talk mm -hmm. about quite a few yeah. things as I, in my next lecture, right? right? So I think I'm going to cover a few things which you were talking about, okay? So I move on to the next one. And then I think